Now here's an interesting little shooter from the 80s, as today's ancient DOS game is known simply as Stargoose, or also as Stargoose Warrior on some packaging, even though the game itself never identifies with that name. Well, I will admit, it's the name of the game which intrigued me more than anything, as I really had no idea what to expect out of this one. Are you a cosmic bird defending the galaxy? Do you go exploring, trying to find long lost artifacts, or defeat evil space monsters? Nah, you just go to some planet called Nom, spelled N-O-M, to swipe some colored jewels. I mean, it's not even clear really if you're playing as a good guy or bad guy. But one thing's for sure, you're absolutely not welcome on this planet given the amount of firepower being thrown at you. Though all kidding aside, don't really have too much to say about this one since it's pretty straightforward. Basically, what you see is what you get, but with a few interesting quirks to keep in mind in order to actually make it through this game alive. Stargoose was originally developed primarily by Stephen Kane and G.P. Everett, and was originally published by Logotron in 1988 in the UK, coming to North America thanks to Spinnaker Software one year later in 1989, under the name Stargoose Warrior on the packaging, and is best described as a one-player action arcade game. It supports CGA 320x200 4-color graphics, EGA 320x200 16-color graphics, and PC speaker sound. As for its current release date, it's still commercial and finding a copy isn't hard so long as you want the Amiga or Atari ST versions, as they're pretty easy to find and pretty cheap when you do. But if you want the DOS version here, be prepared for a hard search and for wildly fluctuating prices, especially if it's fully boxed, as the box alone seems to be worth four times the cost of the discs based on what few numbers I was able to pull up. In fact, based on what I've seen, the Amiga and Atari ST versions are slightly better in a lot of ways, as they can play music and sound effects simultaneously and are much better balanced in terms of gameplay speed. In fact, I was going by how fast those versions of the game went to determine how fast the DOS version should be played, thus why it might seem a little slower moving than you might be used to if you've seen this DOS version of the game before. The story to Stargoose isn't explained very well and is very brief, but the gist of it is that you've been independently hired by a tribal elder of sorts for a bounty mission to go to the planet Nam to collect a large quantity of special jewels found only there. To sweeten the deal, and convince the player to go there in the first place, said elder offers up a Stargoose, which is effectively a heavily armed land skimming craft specially made for these kinds of raids. Once the title credits pass, or the player presses spacebar, the action immediately begins on the first level. In total, there are eight levels, though the game never really indicates which level you're on, so you kind of have to keep counting your head. In the middle of the screen is your star goose. At the bottom left are gauges for your fuel, ammo, and shields. Bottom right shows your score and missiles, while centered at the bottom are your extra lives. Needless to say, run out of lives and the game is over. And as far as I can tell, there is no way to get extras. The gameplay itself is pretty straightforward. You use the arrow keys to move the star goose around, going faster the further up the screen you are, holding spacebar rapidly fires your guns, and the N and M keys both arm and fire your missiles, N for the left launcher and M for the right launcher. Thus, you can arm two missiles at a time. In fact, the manual encourages you to always have your missiles prepped for when you need them. The trick though is that there's a lot of momentum in this game. Your movement and the movement of your missiles has a bit of inertia to it, so you can't make split second reactions. You need to plan your movements a little in advance, and also time your missiles to launch after you move past the point you want to launch them at. It takes a bit to get used to, but once you do, it's not that bad. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the game is the landscape, as there's a sort of 3D effect going on, and yes, the game is keeping track of height values to some extent. For instance, if you're going down a hill and an enemy is ahead of you on a straight path, your bullets are going to hit the path before they reach the enemy because you're effectively firing them at a downward angle. Now, the same goes for if you fire straight ahead and hit the side of a hill. The exception to this are the missiles, as they track the landscape, making them far more effective than your guns for taking things out. In fact, given how much firepower most things take to take down, and given that missiles are one-hit kills against everything, including yourself, it's best to just use missiles most of the time. 
Each level consists of multiple sections connected together with supply tunnels. Now when you enter a supply tunnel, the game will take on a sort of down the tunnel view, and you're able to swing your star goose to the sides and even do full corkscrews through the tunnel if you pick up enough momentum. You'll also run by various eyes of sorts, which are what replenish your fuel, ammo, or shields depending on what resource the tunnel provides. Between levels, you go through a similar connecting tunnel, but get large quantities of points from the eyes instead. You can actually bypass the tunnels, and there's a few instances where this might be the better course of action, but sometimes this will either lead to a forced death, or more typically, will just loop you back to the start of the current section you're in. And no, I have no idea why these pickups are literally eyeballs. It's not explained anywhere. One thing that's really neat is that so long as you're partially lined up with a tunnel entrance, the Star Goose will automatically self-align with it to make going inside easier. Well, this also happens with the missile reload gates, though with the missile reloads, you get one missile per frame you're in contact. So to properly restock, you have to slow all the way down to minimum speed. Otherwise, you may not get to fully replenish your missiles. Fuel is also kind of a big limiting factor, as fuel seems to be based strictly on distance traveled, not time or speed or anything like that. Because of this, there's pretty much no reason to ever go fast, unless the situation calls for it, like trying to dodge past a pair of missiles fired at crossing angles. But this also means skipping any of the supply tunnels may burn more fuel than the levels designed to allow you to handle. In fact, that's where a lot of the difficulty of the game stems from, is simply not knowing what's coming up and making you suffer for your lack of foreknowledge. The levels are not very large, and despite having limited lives, you always start a new game at the level you were last on, so it doesn't take long to learn where the trouble points are so you can deal with them appropriately. In fact, most things in the levels are not really all that dangerous unless you collide with them, as collisions do a lot more damage than guns do, and most enemies are pretty basic, either stationary turrets shooting guns or lobbing ballistic explosives, other land skimming ships moving forward and firing their guns constantly, or stationary mines of some flavor. But the real threat are the missile launchers. As stated, your missiles not only one-hit kill the enemies, the enemy missiles also one-hit kill you. Dealing with missile launchers at range is hard enough given how difficult it is to make split-second reactions given the inertia everything has, but sometimes you don't get any time to react and are pretty much dead instantly. When missile launchers are present in positions you can't normally react to, your only hope is to preempt them, either by holding a particular direction when exiting a supply tunnel, or skipping such a tunnel to take out whatever's on the other side if said tunnel doesn't lead to a different section. Fortunately, any stationary targets you destroy stay destroyed if you lose a life. In fact, any crystals you collect stay collected too, so when you have a fraction of a second to decide between survival or getting the last crystal in a level, sometimes getting the crystal is more important so that you don't have to try a particularly tricky section a second time and risk running out of fuel in the process. Another good tip too is to always slow right the heck down when in a supply tunnel once you pass or collect the second last eye. This way, when you come out of the tunnel, you'll be moving much more slowly and can thus react to what's just outside of the tunnel more readily. Also, when possible, ride on the grid lines, not between them. If you position yourself so that you're centered on a grid line, that gives each of your missiles an opportunity to hit a target ahead of you with minimal effort, and if a missile happens to be fired straight down at you, it means you're already halfway out of the way, so to speak. Whereas if you were centered down a column on the grid and the missile was fired straight down that same column, you're probably not going to have enough time to get out of the way. Ultimately, with enough persistence, you'll reach the end of the 8th level, go through one final supply tunnel filled with points, and your reward is... going back to level 1 and starting it all over again. Okay, admittedly, I beat the game taking advantage of its unlimited continues, so if there's a special ending if you beat all 8 levels in a row without running out of lives, I have no idea, but given there's a particular startup animation on the title screen in the Amiga and Atari ST versions which is absent from the DOS version, I'm going to guess that's a no. Overall, Star Goose is fun, it's challenging, but it's short and very repetitive, as you've pretty much seen everything the game's about by the end of the first level, and are then just expected to go through all of that seven more times, with the exact same graphics, enemies, and everything. 
But that said, as a late 80s DOS game with a tiny dev team, this one is surprisingly competent and worth a play at least once if you get the chance. But given how far gaming has come since then, it probably won't hold your attention for very long. Unsurprisingly, given this game's age, it's highly sensitive to the speed of the computer that you run it on, so you need to set a fixed cycles count. Now, based on the timing I saw with the Amiga and Atari ST versions, I found a cycles count of 700 seemed to lock in the speed of the main gameplay as closely as I could figure, though the supply tunnels have a rather poor frame rate under these conditions comparatively. In fact, it's pretty much impossible to have a single cycle setting which works well for both the main gameplay and tunnels, so one of them is either going to go too slow or too fast. And given that the tunnels have no enemies in them, it makes more sense to have slow tunnels given the choice. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next up, two weeks from now, will be episode 288 on Saturday, July 31st, and we'll be taking a look at a game that I pretty much can't think of a description of which doesn't flat out give it away. Basically, think Tetris, then think how it would be if the playfield and pieces were a lot bigger. And that might give you an idea of what to expect, or maybe just a vague one, so be sure to stay tuned to see this game in action. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small random set of you guys.